had a number of emails asking, how do you make an image like this? How do you paint a picture like this? And the thing is, it's a good choice to explain because it uses materials and methods going back five, six hundred years. So you buy some canvas and stretcher bars and you assemble the frame. Stretch the canvas around all four sides and then all four corners and with a staple gun and canvas pliers, you can use your fingers, staple all around tightly around the whole frame. So that is stretched and ready to go. So the first thing you have to do is decide what this surface is going to be. Because it's raw canvas, one has that choice. If it was a pre-primed, factory bought canvas, they'd already have painted over this. It'd be very hard to get rid of the texture they have here. So the decision is based on the effect you want to get when you see this picture in real life, which is that this it has four main surface, four main areas. The main one is the black which has to be completely flat so that it's a void. If it had any canvas texture here, you'd see it and this face wouldn't be kind of coming out magically through this void. So instead of brushing the gesso on, which will only bring up the, the uh, surface of the canvas, I'm going to actually put, put it on with a palette knife and start getting it into the surface. Try to fill up all the texture. The traditional way to scale up a sketch uh, to a larger size is to square up the image, then make corresponding larger squares here I have two inch squares on the canvas and one centimeter squares on the sketch. This is the way artists made accurate drawings throughout the ages, looking through a square screen, transposing the view of the drawing. Even Van Gogh took such a screen on location. Before you start drawing, it's useful to put on a base color. So here, that's all the oil glazes. That's all just left white. But this whole section, is really the face, is of course a sort of a yellow ochre, brownish colour. So, so a good place to start is the eye. You know, ten down, ten, ten across, square, square, square. Then just keep drawing in everything, relating square by square by square until you know where everything is more or less in place. You may think this whole squaring up thing is just a bit of a trick, but the whole history of art is full of artists' tricks. You also may think but the whole process isn't very creative. But the creative part you've already done, your imaginative sketch, watercolour, that you want to bring into something larger, more permanent. And to get that little thing here up to this, you need method. So this painting will be made in a succession of layers. We've got the white gesso ground. Gesso is a low acidic paint that protects the canvas. And on the left we've put on the ochre colour, which is our base colour for the face and the rocks. So my next stage is filling in the black area 
And because I want it to be just black and dense, I'm adding some pigment to my black paint because black, uh, black paint and white paint are always too transparent. Paints in general can be transparent. You see through them and use the glazing qualities and the transparent qualities. But when you want to put white on and have white, or black on and have black, you need denser paints. And now I've filled in the basic black area. Next I'll put some texture for the rocks on the left hand side. I've got two different texture gels here. One is Liquitex Ceramic Stucco and the other Coarse Sand. And I just put it on with the back of the palette knife kind of randomly and sort of here and there. It doesn't really matter that much because you're going to be painting over this and it's just going to give you something to paint against in a way. All of the background colours here we're using now are, are water-based colours. These are all acrylics. But if this was done 500 years ago, we'd all be using um, tempera colours, which instead of acrylic medium, it would be made with egg yolks. So then use a small sharp palette knife, almost drawing back in the hair, because we don't want any of that texture over the hair, we want that just to stay clean. I'm holding a mile stick. The mile stick allows me to stand away from the picture and look at it and keep a steady hand and do details. So at this stage all one is doing is putting on black paint and white paint because you've already got your ochre background colour. But how do we go from this to this? We start by putting on white paint over everything we don't want to see. The lines, the crosses, everything that's a mess. So I'm adding pigment to make a very dense white paint that will cover all the mess underneath. If you just try to use ordinary paint straight out of the tube, it would be very, very frustrating. Traditionally you do that with a muller, a glass muller, but you know, a palette knife is just fine. Now that will cover anything and it's very stable because the original acrylic paint has got masses of glue of medium in it already. So the white paint has covered all the mess, all the lines. So there's nothing fighting you. You have to keep going back and trying to paint out. I now fill in some mid-tones and that would allow me to finish with acrylics and move on and start using oil paints. The next stage is putting on these glazes. On this side you see this is kind of quite raw looking. And as the glazes go on it will become richer and richer. And on this side to achieve this in several days, because you, you, can't, you can't achieve that in one go. It's got to be done in, in a series of stages. So what we would use here is some oil paint and mineral spirits turpentine. This will thin anything down. You basically use that with oil paint as if it were warty, water. And traditionally what you'd use here is, um, is some linseed oil or some stand oil. But that would take literally weeks to dry between coats. So these days we use this stuff, Liquin or other makes but it's um, an alkyd, fast drying, almost the same 
exactly the same, it dries completely clear. And it, and it acts the same as oil. So we'll put on very thin coats of this, see, like this. And we can thin it down, blend it, do things with it. We can even put water in there. I was going to say water. We could even put in uh, the mineral spirits to water it down and feather the edges and things and give little effects. But that will dry overnight. So that's an oil glaze. A very thin glaze of colour. And the more of those you put on, the more transparent and more layers and the more kind of jewel-like the colour becomes. So you can just lay the glaze on top and because the paint underneath is completely dry you can just keep messing around with it until you get the desired effect. You can put it on, you can water it down with the mineral spirits, <clears throat> you can put more of the glazing fluid on just keep messing around <clears throat> until something starts to look okay. So this is how it looks after a couple of days of glazing over red layers. So it's the same process putting on the black so that I can just go on like this and start getting on a few of these black which in fact it's a very 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 dark brown that I've mixed and I don't like that this is the point about this you you can go like that and say no just gonna try and blend those in a bit you think it's an incredibly tedious process which it is but um, the point is that what you get in the end is a very luminous, almost stained glass effect, as if there is light coming through from behind, as opposed to if you had put on just ordinary oil paint in one layer, it would be flat and solid, but this is going to be all very luminous and uh, really contrast with that as if it is in the distance and there's light coming through and you see what you get and you um, you just play with it so you can keep changing it you're not stuck with one thing at a time I'm just getting some of this glazing onto these rocks and I've laid it, the uh, picture flat so that otherwise it'll just all run down and be a mess. And I've just got very, very thin paint here, putting in little bits of things just later I'll be able to just put more white things, uh, paler things on top for little highlights and things but right now I need to get some sort of sense of um, cragginess and uh, distance and just sort of break it up and then just wash it down and just wash those areas down with the mineral spirits very very thin it's kind of quite random 
random, in fact. You can, it's basically giving yourself a complex texture. Now this isn't black I'm putting on, it's a very, very dark brown that I've mixed. A little bit of brown paint with, it's like, you know, 95% black, but, and it reads as black. But it's far more, it it's, uh, blends in more with the browns, and particularly, and this colour here of the hair, this is um, the same. It's a very, very dark brown. So when it comes in and we're dealing with that face there, there won't be such a shock to, between the colours. So everything around the head is now more or less finished, other than a couple of details. So now it's time to get on and paint the face. I just want to say something about the dark brown colour I keep talking about. It's a pre-mixed colour that I made myself and put into one of these empty tubes. When you're making a painting and you keep coming back to an area of the painting that has the colour you want to match exactly, it's impossible to mix that colour anew each time. So you pre-mix it so the effect is seamless. Now to paint this face, what you basically need is four colours. Traditional colours that, that, that are used. A burnt sienna, white, and a burnt umber into the darker areas. Burnt sienna and white traditionally are what's mixed to make a skin colour. The only, and then going back from the burnt umber areas into our black brown, which we'll use here and use here and use here. But those basically three or four colours is all you need. Then you also see on here is a kind of yellowish. There's a yellowish colour that brightens up these brown colours. That way you can either do it two ways. One, you can just use the brown colours and add a very thin glaze of yellow where you want it. Or you can mix in a yellow, I use Naples yellow, into the paler shades. It doesn't matter one way or the other really. So here is burnt sienna. You see as we mix it with white, we start to get more and more skin colours. Through to white and get variations between the two. Now the Naples yellow, bring that in you see, to the various colours that gives us basically what you have there is a skin tones complete right through to white so as those colors work on what we got going here if we uh, Start bringing a bit of Naples yellow there. That's the pure. That's the pure um, red sienna, burnt sienna. Sorry. Add a bit of the Naples yellow in there. What we want to do here is the um, is not smooth it out. You've got to smooth all this out with a fan brush. So it's absolutely, you know, smooth. But it's kind of too cartoon-like. 
it's sort of like computer art. What you actually want to get is more of this kind of feeling of stippled paint colour. Then it's sort of a, a bit more like skin because you know that it has lots and lots of little imperfections and texture to it. Then this final thing here will have its own texture. This red will have its texture. This all the rocks have their own texture. And so the face itself will feel remarkably real. This sort of painting, you, you have to have a reference. I mean, you either got a model in front of you, you're copying, or you've got a photograph you're copying, or a landscape you're copying. So that's just the first coat of oil paint that I have to let dry before I go on to the next stage. The way I'm going to deal with this <coughs> flare of white paint is mask it off with some masking tape, just painter's tape, and with acrylic over the glaze, which is totally stable, just basically sort of make some stuff with the back of my palette knife like this. Stuff you just cannot do with a paintbrush. Down here I can paint it in solid, but this kind of thing that here, and the point is you can, if you want, take a sponge and take it straight off. But that's not looking bad, so I'm going to keep that. Let it dry and then do the next little section. All you can do <clears throat> is just keep adding and adding bits until you are satisfied. Blending little areas that need to be blended. Trying to keep a little texture, not make it too smooth. There I'm running into trouble because there's too much stuff there. Come back out again. This little area is fine. So the final stage is to keep applying these refining glazes until you're satisfied with what you see. After a couple of weeks, maybe a month, you need to apply a varnish across the whole thing because some areas are flat some areas are glossy and by applying the varnish you pull everything together into one cohesive composition. So that's how you make a painting like this. The thing about a painting is it has a living presence in a way a photograph can never have. 